If you want to take your Rust game to the next level, getting proficient in macros is one surefire way to do that. It's pretty feasible to be a Rust developer for a really long time and never need to write your own macro, so it's an easy topic to defer. So what are macros and what makes them so powerful? Well, a macro takes a fragment of code as input and produces another fragment of code as output that gets included in your compiled Rust program. What can you do with that? Well, basically a ton of stuff that you can't do with the Rust language out of the box. On the simpler side of things, you can create a function like macro that takes a variable number of arguments. One example of that you might be familiar with is printline. Printline takes a string slice as the first argument and it can interpolate any number of variables into that string slice. So if my string slice that I pass in as a first argument is hello somebody and somebody, I can interpolate those values in by doing let A equals Bob and let B equals Alice. And then I can pass A in as a second argument and B in as the third argument and I can pass in as many arguments as necessary to interpolate into the string slice. On the more involved side of things, you can create a macro that takes a completely custom domain-specific language as input and produces Rust code as output. The best example of this that comes to mind is a U framework that has the HTML macro that takes an HTML-like language as input and produces Rust code as output. This is kind of similar to the React framework's JSX syntax in the JavaScript world. Stepping back a bit, there's actually two main ways to define Rust macros, declaratively and procedurally. Declarative macros allow you to implement function-like macros that we just saw. Procedural macros do allow you to implement function-like macros, but they also allow you to implement other types of macros like attribute-like macros and custom-derived macros, but they can be a little more complicated than declarative macros. Attribute-like macros are invoked like this and allow you to generate code based on the thing that you're annotating with the macro. Custom derived macros look like this and allow you to generate an implementation of a given trait for any struct that the custom derive is attached to. In this video, we're gonna cover declarative macros, which are usually a little more concise and straightforward than implementing them procedurally, but still very powerful. Declarative macros are sort of like Rust match clauses on steroids. The syntax can be a little overwhelming at first, but they can be pretty straightforward once you understand the core concepts. The macro that we're gonna build in this video is a set macro. So it's basically a shorthand for hash set from. If we wanna make a hash set in Rust, one way to do it is to do hash set from and then pass an array into that function. So we can do let sum set equals So we need to import hash set. If we're creating a lot of hash sets, this can get a little verbose. So what we're gonna do in this video is create a declarative macro that is able to create a hash set from a variable number of arguments. What we ultimately wanna be able to do is this. Some set equals set, and then we just pass in one, two, three, and that's it. So we're basically making a shorthand for hash set from. This is not a very shiny use case for macros. All we're doing is creating a shorthand for hash set colon colon from which is not that much typing anyway, but once you understand how to write a declarative macro like this, it covers all the core concepts that you need to write pretty much anything. I did mention that declarative macros are a lot like match clauses. So let's look at a match clause really quickly. Let's say we have a variable thing that's five and we wanna write a match clause on that thing. So a match clause consists of multiple arms, each arm of which is gonna contain expression and then a result. So you can have literals as a match arm. So I could do five, print line it is five. Then I can also put an identifier in an arm like A and I can have it do A arm. So we're actually we're gonna have this say five arm and then A arm. And then we're going to run this and we should see five arm. Okay, these match arms are executed in order. The first arm that matches the input variable is the one that's gonna be run. So in this case, it's five. If we were to take the second line, A, which is an arbitrary identifier, and put that above five, now when we run it, the A arm is run because five matches A, it makes A an I32, and it runs the contents of the A arm. So the important thing to note here is that it's executing these match arms in order. Now that we have that covered, we're gonna write the simplest macro ever. The syntax for a declarative macro always starts with macro rules. And then the name of the macro, this one's not gonna do anything, so we're gonna name it as such. And then open French brace as if it's a function. And now we saw the match clause has arms. Declarative macros have rules and rules are kind of like arms. And each rule has something on the left side and something on the right side. On the left side is what's called the matcher. 
And on the right side is what's called the capture. And we have a semicolon after each rule. So in this case, nothing burger doesn't do anything. It doesn't take any input and it produces no output. It's the simplest macro we can possibly write. So let's try running this. The way we'd execute that is nothing burger. And then even though it doesn't do anything, this should actually compile. Okay, we got no output, but it compiled. So we've already written a simple macro. Now we're gonna write another simple macro that's actually gonna output some code, but it's not gonna take any code as input. Again, it's gonna have one rule. The matcher is gonna be empty because it's not gonna take any input. And the expansion is just gonna have a print line statement. We're gonna say, where's Ferris? Now let's run this macro. Cool, okay, so we got a print line. The compiler is seeing this Hello Ferris invocation, running through the rules of the Hello Ferris macro, picking the first one that matches, and then replacing the Hello Ferris invocation with the contents of the expansion associated with that matcher. Now we're gonna try adding more rules to this Hello Ferris macro. Separate rules with semicolon. Our next rule is gonna take a literal. Matchers can take literals, so in this case we're gonna do Ferris. This rule is gonna match when the input to the hello ferris invocation is the literal ferris. In this case, we're gonna do print line hello ferris, and then we're gonna try calling it with ferris. Make sure that, yeah, so now it went through the first rule and it didn't match because there was input and the first rule has no input. So it skipped over that one and it went to the second one and it matched that one and replaced the Hello Ferris invocation with print line Hello Ferris. The literal in the matcher can be of any type. So I could, it doesn't have to be a string slice. It could be, this could be one. And I could do one here and we get the same result. Pretty simple. Now, what if we want to match on an arbitrary literal instead of a specific one like Ferris? So for that, we have something called captures. A capture is kind of like a variable in that it has a type, but its type is not a traditional type. It's actually a code fragment type. So the first thing we do to make a capture is give it a name and names for captures are always prefixed with a dollar sign. We're gonna call this one S and then we do colon and then the type of code fragment it is. So in this case, we're gonna do literal. And then the rest, we write the expansion just like we did. So we can do print line and then we can use the name of that capture in the expansion. So we can do hello and then interpolate that value um, and then do dollar sign S. Let's try calling that. Oops, forgot my exclamations. So we pass in an arbitrary literal, in this case, ASDF, a string slice, and try to match on the first one. It's gonna go through the rules of hello x and replace the invocation with the expansion associated with the matcher that matches. So in this case, there's only one rule. So it's gonna to try to match this S literal capture, uh, which it will because it's a string slice. And then it's gonna execute or replace the invocation with that code. So in this case, that's hello ASDF. This is an example of passing an arbitrary literal to the macro invocation. What if we wanna pass a variable in? Let's try that. So let's do let A equals ASDF, and then hello X A. Okay, that's not compiling, why is that? No rules expected for token A. And that's because we have a rule for an arbitrary literal, but the variable name is not a literal. A variable name is another code fragment type called an ident or an identifier. So let's make another rule for identifiers and see if that fixes it. Cool, so we know the second branch ran because we added this ident string in here. We can also throw a specific literal in here as well if we want, so we can do charlie. Um, and as long as that's before the capture of the code fragment type literal, that's gonna get run if the input is charlie, so. Run that. Okay, so the first rule ran. Um, if we put this after this literal capture, the literal capture should match first because it gets looked at first. 
And so we should get hello comma Charlie instead next time. And we do. We do have kind of some duplicate code here. So we have this s literal and s ident branch, and they basically do the same thing. Uh, the, the string slice is a little different, but say we want them to be the same, say we wanted to do that. Is there any way to consolidate these? And the answer is yes. There's another code fragment called expression that covers both ident and literal. So we can write another rule, we can do s expression, And we can actually remove these, let's remove Charlie too. So we only have one rule now. And this one should still work. It should say, hello, Charlie, because this is a literal and a literal is an expression. So it should get captured by the expression capture. That works. And then we can also pass in an ident. So that's A. So expression captures literals and idents. If you want more details on the different types of code fragments, there's a great page in the little book of Rust macros that describes all the fragment specifiers. And this goes through each one of them, gives you examples of each one, it's super handy. So we can see an expression, we have literals identifiers. So now that we understand captures, we're almost ready to implement that set macro that we looked at in the beginning. There's actually one more concept we need to understand to implement the set macro that we looked at in the beginning, and that is repetitions. And repetitions allow you to capture any arbitrary number of code fragments in the input to the macro. For the set macro, we need to accept an arbitrary number of values as input. And so repetitions allow us to do that. So the syntax for repetitions is, so we'll make this match right here. There's gonna be one rule for this macro, dollar sign. And then the thing you wanna match repeated occurrences of, which in our case is an expression. So we'll do S expression. So dollar sign and then parentheses and then a close parentheses, that's our repetition. Then after the closing parentheses, there's two things that come after that, one of which is optional and one of which is required. The first one, which is optional, is a separator. So in our case, we could do comma. After the separator is a repetition type and the repetition type can be one of three things. It can be an asterisk, which is, this is sort of like a regex. An asterisk is zero to many, question mark is zero or one of this code fragment and a plus is one or more of this code fragment. Once we have that, we just implement the expansion and the expansion can reference the contents of the repetition no matter how many expressions we're taking we're always going to do hash set from and then open bracket we're going to make an array here and then inside that array we're going to want to kind of expand what we matched and to do that you do a syntax similar to what the expansion looks like in the matcher so you do dollar sign and then open parens and then you reference the capture that we had in our matcher so dollar sign s and that's how it knows which repetition we're referring to and then we also have to specify the asterisk uh, that we wanted to actually want this to be an asterisk over here as well okay so that should do it so because we have that variable name inside the repetition reference in the expansion because you can have multiple repetitions in the matcher so in our case we only have one but if you had multiple repetitions in the matcher you could potentially have multiple variable names using the variable name inside this repetition syntax in the expansion tells the compiler which repetition you're referring to from the matcher and then let's try executing this let a equals set one two three and let's do dbg a See if make sure that's a uh, hash set. Oops, I forgot to put the, you also have to put the separator as well to tell it which repetition you're referring to. So I forgot the comma up there. And there we go, we got our hash set. This is a very simple one line macro and you might argue that it's not incredibly useful. It just saves you a little bit of typing, but it contains the concepts that allow you to write something a lot more complex. So we understand captures and we understand repetitions and we understand how rules, matchers and expansions work. So you can take those and write something a lot more complex. That's a quick walkthrough of how to write declarative macros in Rust. One other aspect of Rust that's really important to understand is smart pointers. Check out this video for the lowdown on smart pointers, what they do, how to use them, when to use them, etc. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.